Ken Schwartz, I serve as the law clerk to Justice Cardino, so this is my Supreme Court. I'm also the coordinator for the 2022 Summer Pre-Law Program. If you are not familiar with the Pre-Law Program, it's an educational program organized by the judiciary. It's designed to offer support to see my locals who are thinking about a career in the law. Um, the program involves students taking several weeks of intensive law classes that are designed to simulate the experience of being in the first year of law school. In order to teach these classes, we can fly out to professors from the mainland um, in order to allow the broader community uh, a chance to learn about the law and interact with the professors who are teaching the program. We also organize this Law in the Community Lecture Series. This is the fourth and final lecture. Um, if you want to see the previous three lectures, uh, although they will probably have a new permanent home at some point, at the moment all the previous lectures are now available on the uh, CNMI Judiciary's homepage website if you scroll down uh, a bit. Um, two quick things before we begin. First, please silence your cell phones. We may have the world's greatest thing zone, but we want to hear it here right now. Um, <laughs> Second, the PLAW program and the law of the lecture series have been made, made possible in part by a very generous uh, donation from the Northern Brown Hispanics Council. We thank the council for their support. Uh, at the end of the lecture, uh, on behalf of the council, I'll be distributing uh, a very brief survey for you to fill out. Now, uh, our, our speaker today has come a long way back home to Saipan, all the way from uh, Washington, D.C., where she serves as an associate professor at Georgetown Law School. Please give a warm welcome to Associate Professor Yuki Hong. Thank you, Professor Hong. Uh, I'm just going to warn everyone before I start that we took the definition of public very broadly. Um, and so Liberty Interest is here, and I'm just going to warn you, there is nothing I can do to silence that. <laughs> so bear with us, please. Um, welcome. My name is Wendy Hahn, and I'm an associate professor of law legal practice at Georgetown University Law Center, as, as I mentioned. And I've been privileged to be able to be teaching in the free law program this summer um, and to get to know the students in the program. Um, I'm not sure they believe me yet, but I really have been telling them for days now that, that I've been really impressed uh, with their engagement, with their hard work, um, with, and with their ability to work with the law and legal issues. It has been really an honor to work with this group, and I want to make sure that everybody else who's here hears uh, how wonderful they feel. Um, for those of you who attended my lecture last week and who just heard Ben, you also know I grew up here, I'm from here, I attended elementary and middle school just down the street at Saipan Community School, so thank you, uh, Roberto, who is a friend from a long time ago, <laughs> as well, that I'll highlight. Um, and just thank you to the Humanities Council, to the Judiciary, um, and especially also to Professor Rose Cusopelia Zor, who has been such a wonderful colleague uh, to work with as well as a black students. My lecture today is about cross cultural conflict. Um, and so I want to be talking sort of around that idea of cross cultural conflict, however, we might be approaching it. And the impetus for the lecture is really the new ABA standard, three of us, which I'll explain what that is in a little bit, um, revised just this past February, February 20th. The standard basically requires law schools to provide an education to law students on bias, cross-cultural competency, and racism. So as part of touching on that standard and on the topic of cross-cultural competence, I want to go through cross-cultural competence sort of generally as a concept, um, then talk about the ABA's role as an accounting body for law schools in the US. Um, talk a little bit about the broader context relevant for the push for cross-cultural competency in the law, and then come back to the standards themselves, how they might be implemented, some critiques of the standard, and um, some benefits, potentially, of the standard, and really end with a lot of the 
this discussion on implications for practice. And for that discussion of implications for practice, I would especially love to hear about your practice experiences, your lived experiences. So if you start thinking um, about, as you're listening to what you might want to share. Um, and I'll just warn you that if you start looking tired or fidgety, I might call out. Um, so standard 303, that's the main, for 303C, that's the main change in the standards that I want to talk about today. So we, so that we understand what framework we're working from, I'll share the language, the new language, that's been adopted and is effective as of February 2022 for law schools. And so this is specifically for law schools, and I'll explain more about the ABA's role and what strength the standards have in the movement. So this newly added standard, 303C, again says that law schools shall provide, so that's a requirement, education to law students on bias, cross-cultural competency, and racism at the start of the program of legal education, so at the very beginning of law school when students enter law school, or near the beginning of when students enter law school, and at least once again before graduation. So they want law students to understand or be educated to get on uh, these topics again before they graduate, likely with the idea that students might, as upper level students, have more familiarity with legal concepts and start working these ideas together. Um, and then the standard sort of wraps up with for students engaged in law clinics or field placements, the second occasion will take place before, concurrently with, or as part of their clinical or field placement courses. So there's an ability to combine uh, some of the coursework there. If we want to unpack this, I really want us to highlight, sort of focus on the term cross-cultural competency and what that means. So I'll unpack that by first talking about one of those words, culture. There are two common definitions of culture we've talked in the course about common definitions a lot. So I'll pull from Merriam Webster's. Um, there are two common definitions of culture that are available in the dictionary, and a few more. One is that culture is the customary beliefs, social forms, and material traits of a racial, religious, or social group. And so I'll observe here that this first definition seems to imply that culture is set or frozen and could be described later as if one were to take a photograph and describe it. The other definition that also shows up in Merriam-Webster's is that culture is or includes the characteristic features of everyday existence, such as diversions or a way of life shared by people in a place or time. So now we're starting to get a broader sense of culture as sort of features or ideas that are shared across people. Perhaps people <coughs> who share other kinds of group characteristics. Culture in the law, or at least in legal theory, has been discussed as any set of shared signifying practices. And this is by Naomi Menzi, uh, who is a colleague of mine at Georgetown currently, but has wrote in as early as 2001 this kind of leading article discussing law and culture and their overlap. And so she again said, culture is any shared set of shared signifying practices, practices by which meaning is produced, performed, contested, or transformed. So culture is something by which people discern meaning that might be shared. Nancy further stated in this article that cultures are never neat, bounded, or complete. And so cultural boundaries are really never necessarily set. They're malleable. Um, and it might be a little reductive, I would posit, to think of cultural boundaries as set and able to be predicted necessarily. Susan Bryant, a law professor who taught clinical students, had another somewhat overlapping definition of culture. And this might be the one that seems a little more sort of understandable practically. 
the many. She said, culture is the logic by which we give order to the world. Culture gives us our values, attitudes, and norms of behavior. We are constantly attaching culturally based meaning to what we see and hear, often without being aware that we are doing so. Through our invisible cultural lens, we judge people to be truthful, rude, intelligent, or superstitious based on the attributions we make about the meaning of their behavior. That meaning comes back again. Bryant was one of the leaders, early leaders, in appreciating the need to educate law students about cross-cultural conflict. And she noted that to become good cross-cultural lawyers, assuming that that was a goal, students must first become aware of the significance of culture on themselves. So a few observations here. If culture derives somewhat from group sharing, it logically follows that culture can derive from some shared characteristics such as geography, ethnicity, nationality, age, etc. And that sort of makes sense with our more popular understanding of culture. It also logically follows that, as Susan Bryant asserted, we may each individually be multicultural. We each have a multiplicity of identities and associations, and so we each might be able to use different lenses uh, with which to view a set of circumstances on interaction, particularly in interaction with clients, uh, students, etc. There's another side to this, too. So within each broad cultural group, so even though some of us like share characteristics with others, they may, there may be a lot of variance right, and evolution. So we, again, cannot necessarily reduce a group's responses to a pre-programmed sort of outcome or set of responses. So for example, two individuals who identify as lawyers in the CNMI might have broad similarities, but very different specific responses to the same set of circumstances. Now, finally, if we assume law as culture, which is sort of what Naomi Bezzi was leading towards in her article, um, or at least has overlapped with culture, then that also means that as lawyers, or as people who think about or engage otherwise with the law, we address issues of cross-cultural competency every day. So putting all of that together at its most general and sort of simplest form, cross-cultural competence is the ability to interact effectively with individuals who have diverse backgrounds, values, beliefs, norms, etc., with the assumption that perhaps these are individuals that approach a situation with a different mind than we might as lawyers or students. Now, as lawyers, the interaction contemplated might be again, the various ways in which we interact with clients. It might be the ways we interact with other lawyers. It might be the ways we interact with judges, with law clerks, et cetera, actors in the law. Um, or it might be the ways we represent interests. Sometimes we advocate for particular positions out of a group interest or out of sort of a theoretical stance that we might have. So let's hold on to this for a few minutes, and I want to um, talk now about what the ABA, the American Bar Association, has to do with this. The American Bar Association is essentially, for those of you who are not lawyers and who are as familiar, um, a, they're essentially a professional organization. They have a long history. They were formed in 1878, um, generally to advance the interests of lawyers, to consider issues facing the legal profession, uh, to set some guidelines for the legal profession. So for example, one of the things they're known for are their model rules of professional conduct, which is the foundation for a lot of our ethics and professional responsibility rules. Um, just as clarification for those who are not as familiar, the model rules don't themselves have force, the jurisdictions can adopt the model rules or some portion of them. The ABA in 1879, so we're paying attention to dates, 
the year after, so right after they formed, established the Standing Committee on Legal Education and Admissions to the Bar. This was one of its first committees. So one key sort of interest of the ABA was to ensure educational quality for lawyers, to make sure that lawyers, future lawyers, would be trained to a certain standard um, and be able to enter practice with certain goals in mind and with some skills to contemplate things. In 1921, the ABA issued its first standards for legal education. And again, so this was an effort to articulate and make judgments about the quality of legal education uh, being provided to lawyers in training um, in a way that reflected the values of the profession itself and also to provide confidence to state bar admissions authorities. So now what's happened the, is basically the standards don't exist simply as text. Um, the standards basically set the guidelines for accreditation for law schools in the U.S. Law schools that are accredited by the ABA in the U.S. are generally, by many jurisdictions, if not all, then recognized providing a certain standard of education to the students coming out of those institutions, and many jurisdictions require graduation from an ABA accredited law school in order for someone to sit for the bar exam, for example, or to be barred as an attorney. The CNMI bar has basically the same requirement. The CNMI bar under Rule 71 2 requires an applicant to have graduated with a Juris Doctor degree from a law school within the United States, its territories, or professions, and which is accredited by the ABA at the time of the applicant's graduation. And some of you might, who are more familiar with the details, might know that there are some exceptions to this uh, in the CNMI bar admissions rules, but generally, this is the standard. We want students to have graduated from an ABA accredited law school. That means something. And just to explain a little more about what that looks like in practice, really what happens is the ABA sends a review panel to a law school um, and actually does a site review of every law school that it credits. The school itself has to fill out a questionnaire, provide a lot of data, um, and then the ABA council uh, on accreditation will then accredit the school, and that again counts for something. It has some meaning to lawyers, bar examiners. It also has economic meaning because those tend to be the law schools where students will want to attend. So now we have some information about culture and what cross cultural communication means generally and the ABA's role. So I'd like to bring in some other sort of broader context that might help us make sense and start building connections about this idea that cross-cultural competency is relevant for lawyers and for specifically law students. And I'll start with sort of the point that we might, some of us lawyers might be sensitive about. But in 2000, about 2000 to 2001, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, which is sort of a widely respected group, um, issued a report following a review of <coughs> law schools in the US. And in its report, acknowledged that the use of Socratic dialogue in the first part of law school, which is then followed by other kinds of courses like seminar courses in the second and third years, were generally sound, but contained room for improvement. Specifically, the report's authors said, the dramatic result of the first year of law school's emphasis on well honed the skills of legal analysis should be matched by similarly strong skill in serving clients and a strong ethical grounding. So reading between the lines a little bit, I'm interpreting this a little bit as, all right, you guys are doing a great job at teaching people how to analyze information. But we also need to do just as good a job at teaching students how to work with clients 
and teaching students ethics or values related to the professional model. Now, also in the 1990s to 2000s, the idea of cultural competency started gaining traction in the healthcare community based on data about disparities in delivery of healthcare services for different populations. Different populations were getting different treatment, uh, which you might sort of infer indicates possibly different outcomes. Problems included stereotypes, inappropriate assumptions, linguistic barriers, and differences in norms that healthcare professionals did not understand or appreciate, which became than barriers to provision of effective care and services. So culturally competent care became centered in the medical profession around reducing disparities for disadvantaged communities. They also sort of started thinking about this other concept, patient-centered care, uh, which focused around improving quality across the board for every patient. There's a lot of overlap in those concepts. But the takeaway is that at least in the medical profession, cultural competency is already and has for decades been part of professional training. So law, we just took care of this 2022. Um, all right, so a little more context. Like going back to Susan Bryant, uh, in 2001, she wrote one of the first major articles addressing cultural competency based on her clinical teaching with Jane Crow Peter. So if her folks were not as familiar, in law school, students are offered clinics, which really means that they can take part in what seems like sort of a mini law firm, a mini sort of law legal services organization, and actually work with clients to represent the clients for particular matters under supervision of faculty uh, and some professionals. So Sue Bryant asked in her article, when contemplating the role of culture and lawyering, how can lawyers correctly attribute meaning to their clients' behavior and thereby make better lawyering decisions? And so again, an embedded assumption is that clients need to make good lawyering or lawyers need to make good lawyering decisions. A good lawyering decision depends on understanding your client. Uh, and attributing meaning effectively to clients' behaviors. Bryant and Jinko Peters really were, again, interested in teaching clinical students how to effectively represent the clients in the clinic, which included educating, already doing the work of educating the students on how to deal with cultural issues, avoid cultural blunders, and recover from the inevitable cultural blunders that might come up uh, because we're human and students are human. They recognized that on a micro level, this work would engage would result in more effective client representation from client to client. But on a larger scale, argued that but including cross-cultural competency as a learning outcome or goal would build a more just legal system. Now, broadening out a little bit, and I'll also note that law schools themselves, despite early work by clinicians and other folks, law schools themselves are not necessarily free of elitism, bias, or even discriminatory conduct. Um, they're not entirely always culturally competent environments. There are some scholarship by folks who, here you'll see a Swapabella Krishna and Carol Silver uh, interviewed in specifically international JD students in US law schools. And some of the student narratives are troubling. One of the students interviewed described how a professor referred to her and another student only by their last names because, according to the student who was being interviewed, she thought it was probably easier for the professor. And she sort of remarked or commented in part of the interview that the two students that were referred to by their last names were the only 
to students referred to by their last names in the entire class. The same student also wondered whether the fact that she did not get full called on at the beginning of the semester was because her name was simply just not as easy for the professor to say as other names. Other studies of writing show that, at least at the college level, evaluators who look at students' writing, uh, particularly L2 students' writing, so that's shorthand for folks who speak English as a second language, and tend to fill in meaning for students that may or may not necessarily be there. And at the law school level, we might imagine, especially those lawyers in the room who shared common training, uh, that writing that tends to contain fewer errors in grammar, incorporates certain vocabulary, or presents certain kinds of sentence structures uh, might be evaluated more favorably because we might assume that a lack of what we call surface errors in the field uh, indicates greater comprehension or mastery of the substantive material. So there's a lot of layers that might show up in law school, uh, and particularly with the names, as well as mentioned, uh, as I mentioned in talking about this particular piece. Um, and if you're interested, shameless plug for myself, um, some of this discussion of names and scholarship led me to write an article in the Journal of Legal Education on the importance of learning our students' name, names as a matter of first priority when teaching. Um, and I promise if you have sharp eyes, it says there are 300 downloads here. Those are not all by me. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, my husband, was responsible for some of those. <laughs> um, but just as an aside, too, that importance of names as a topic, um, I'll share Irma Herrera, whose picture you see there, is a lawyer and activist who created a one woman show about her experience with bias and stereotypes, including in the law, which included her experience generally, including being told what someone thought was the more correct pronunciation of her name. So lots of issues that might come up uh, in all of our interactions with each other. I want to acknowledge some very serious history, too. The shooting of Trayvon Martin in 2012 and long unacknowledged anti-black violence led to the Black Lives Matter movement, as many of you likely already know. After the killings of Amon Arbery in February of 2020, Breonna Taylor in March 2020, George Floyd in May 2020, and many others, it seemed like the world had exploded, and this was on um, everyone's consciousness. 2020 also saw a rise in anti-AAPI hate in um, FBI data as of fall 2021 showed a rise of about 70%, 73% um, of hate crime incidents in 2020 over 2019 levels, so just in a year of measurement. And the organization Stop AAPI Hate reported much more frequency of incidents that did not arise to the level of a hate crime, so anything from to assaults um, that are not necessarily categorized officially as hate <coughs> And much of this was attributed to the COVID-19 pandemic. So finally, in July 2020, 150 law school deans signed and submitted a letter to the ABA, to the American Bar Association. In the letter, the deans urged the ABA to adopt anti-racism and cultural awareness measures in law schools because such skills, and I'll quote here, are essential parts of professional competence, legal <coughs> practice, and being a lawyer. So of course there's a lot more social context, law school context, or history that I'm glossing over or missing. Um, and there's some ambiguity likely as to correlation versus causation on some of these events. Um, and section for standard 303C. And I'll welcome any comments on that during the debate time. Uh, but at any rate, the ABA revised the standards, so now we're back to the standards, 
with again the revisions becoming effective in February 2022. Um, and as to standard 303 broadly, I want to continue focusing on standard 303C in particular, but I want to show you the other context. So 303 broadly is the standard that addresses curriculum, so law school curriculums. So 303A starts in a fairly sort of standard and inoffensive way. Uh, we need certain numbers of credits in certain kinds of areas. Um, this has been sort of a long-standing standard, um, and this includes um, writing experience, experiential courses of six credit hours, etc. This one is not really in dispute. It hasn't been changed. Standard 303B and C is where the changes started being made. So I've left this kind of in a markup form so you can see what the changes are. We added, or the ABA added for 303B, this requirement that law schools shall provide substantial opportunities for the development of professional identity for law schools. And then C is the one that's a little more contentious that a law school should provide or shall provide education on bias, cultural competency, and racism. And then again, this requirement takes place, so it should take place at the start of legal education and then again before graduation. So this is actually a huge change. So again, if you notice the market, the prior standards hadn't addressed cultural competency directly at all, especially not here in the curriculum guidance. Other places where they sort of touched on cultural competency were two other sort of main standards, which I'll just point out for um, context. There was a standard 206 or standard 206 on diversity and inclusion. And standard 206 required a law school to demonstrate a commitment to diversity and inclusion by providing opportunities for the study of law and entry into the, into the profession um, to members of underrepresented groups. And basically, this sort of meant some kind of commitment are showing to having a student body that is diverse with respect to they specify certain categories with um, respect to gender, race, and ethnicity. So basically this amounts to, we're sort of making some observations about this, um, that the ABA wanted, initially at least, diversity by the numbers, like structural diversity. In its interpretation, Of that standard interpretation to <coughs> the ABA sort of assumed that having structural diversity, so diversity in terms of the numbers, would itself promote cross cultural understanding. So putting people who are different in the same room together promotes cross cultural understanding because we just sort of automatically teach and learn from each other. So if you can tell from my tone, there's a little bit of a potentially, yeah. Um, another place where cross cultural competency was touched on was under standard 302, which is about the learning outcomes in law schools. So, this isn't cross cultural competency, isn't actually mentioned at all, but there's this sort of bucket category at the bottom for other professional skills. And in interpretation 302.1, the ABA acknowledged that <coughs> other professional skills might include cultural competency, but that's after, right, um, fact development and analysis, trial practice, document drafting, conflict resolution, organizing, and managing legal work, and collaboration with some other things. So that's sort of where this idea of cultural competency um, as something to teach students be, who are planning on becoming legal professionals or lawyers uh, was in prior to this new 303C. Now, 303C 
provides a little more in its interpretations for law schools to work with in terms of what this uh, educational sort of topic of cross-cultural competence means. But you might notice here it's not necessarily much, and I'll talk about um, some critiques based on that in a moment. So interpretation 303.6, so this is interpreting standard 303.6 sort of implies that the skill of cross-cultural competency um, really reflects the, or is part of the obligation of lawyers to promote a justice system that provides equal access and eliminates bias, discrimination, and racism in the law. So that's kind of the broader goal is contemplated uh, by the legal profession, at least by the APA's representation of the legal profession. And then 307 discusses some ways to educate students as to cross-cultural competency. Uh, these include orientation sessions for incoming students, lectures on topic, on related topics, courses incorporating the topics, uh, or other educational experiences incorporating Schools are required to have a plan in place by this coming fall, fall 2022, as to how they plan to comply with the requirements or with the changes and have full implementation of the plan by next fall, by fall 2023. Uh, so that's for those of you with a pre-law program when some of you are contemplating entering law school. So of course, with every change, there are detractors and promoters, both sides with some valid arguments, critiques of the newly revised standard, um, focused on sort of the act of the amendment itself and the content. Um, a group of 10 Yale law professors was a very vocal group, and they wrote a letter to the ABA that mandated this as a requirement is a misconstruction of the ABA as an accreditation institution and an intrusion on the autonomy of law schools. Uh, and their position was that law schools should really be free to design their own curriculum. Um, another line of critique from the other side was that the new standard is really was really too vague or is too vague to provide substantial education so it doesn't do enough um, because there is no concrete course requirement. Um, the change has really been seen by some of the baby step to start informal conversation about these topics as opposed to substantive education on these topics. And of course, there's always someone, so others have said that the amendment is a political attempt to teach critical race theory. Now, there are benefits um, that have been recognized with the new standard as well. So the National Association for Law Placement, or NALP, um, commented that the new amendment really overall would strengthen compliance and public trust in the profession by doing a few things, by building within each law student a deep responsibility as to and care for a client or two clients. Second, that it would actually foster student well-being by providing students with a diverse set of experiences in law school and a sense that law school authorities are aware of their points of view. Um, third, that the revision or amendment would help develop students' sort of relational skills as to clients, problem-solving skills, and professional judgment. And that for the, there might be a broader benefit, which sort of echoes some of that language in the interpretation of the standard itself, that the change would promote equal access to law and begin to remove bias, discrimination, and racism in the law. Others sort of saw this as potentially actually aligning with law firms, many sort of large law firms' recent DEI initiatives and focus on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion within law firms themselves. 
But I want to talk a bit about what this might mean um, for practice, because I think that's what most of us are more interested in, um, and why this might relate to practice or be important for practice. Um, and as with the other stories I told you about law school and the interviews done with students in <coughs> law schools, um, there's some information out there about interactions lawyers have had with each other uh, or lawyers have had with clients uh, or theoretically may have with each other or with clients. In 2014, Dr. Eric Reeves uh, through Nexians, this was sort of virtually su supported by the ABA, uh, ran a study on the potential impact of confirmation bias, which is a type of implicit bias, on law firm partners reading an associate's written work. The, in the study, they involved or she involved 60 partners from 22 law firms. And the partners themselves were fairly diverse as law firm partners go. Um, the group included 23 women, 37 men, 21 individuals who were who had self-described to be in a racial or ethnic minority group, and 39 individuals who had self-described as white. All of the 60 partners received the same research memo written by a hypothetical male third-year litigation associate. Half the partners were told that the associate was white, and the other half were told that the associate was black. Overall, now again, the memos were exactly the same. This was the same memo given to every partner. The memo included intentionally several kinds of Overall, partners who read the memo that they thought was written by a black male associate responded more negatively to the memo, the memo, the same memo, than partners who read the memo they thought was written by a white male associate. Out of seven intentionally included minor spelling and grammar errors and the surface errors, readers identified it identified an average of 5.8, so 5 to 6, for the black male writer, versus 2.9, so 2, 3, 4, ish, for the white male writer. So more surface errors noticed in the writing itself based on the very limited information the partners have about the writer's identity. Um, substantive errors were more consistent. So as a substance of errors, there's a little bit of a difference, uh, but not as much. But the surface errors, or the notice of the surface errors, so just I'll give you the numbers so that I know some of you might be interested. In terms of the substantive writing errors, readers identified 4.9, an average of 4.9 for the black male writers versus 4.1 for the white male writers. So again, relatively close, but a large difference in the surface errors. So overall, based on the results of the study, Dr. Reeves determined that there was a little bit of confirmation bias going on in terms of the readers. They were looking for surface errors, or they were primed to look for errors in the writing based on the limited information again that they had of the writer's identity and found them. Now, so that's sort of has serious implications for how we interact with each other right, as voters um, and what we might look for if we know some information about uh, another voter. On a lighter note, so still touching on this idea of cultural differences and appreciating and anticipating for cultural differences, uh, the cultural differences themselves can lead to communication issues. Now, just zoom into this. Sorry, I'm an IT person's worst nightmare. <laughs> so, what we have here is this is a paper or a table in a paper, an Anglo Dutch translation guide. The front of the paper co authored by two medical doctors and a labor mobility expert. And the idea was that even when there are two cultures with a history of cooperation, and geographic proximity, and a lot of shared language, there are still a lot of differences. So what you see here is sort of what um, 
feedback means and how it's interpreted and with how that sort of translated differently based on cultural differences. Okay, I'm going to highlight one in particular. This one says the method, so the British write, the method is described as rather original. The British mean and the Dutch read, it's a good method. So even again, when we're working across cultures, even with a lot of shared characteristics, there might be sort of misunderstanding that takes place and sort of gaps in implementation and things uh, that come up. So what are we supposed to do? I want to talk a little bit just to close the loop on the law school topic uh, about what law schools might do, but then I really want to talk about um, some strategies we might take as individuals and um, hear from you as well uh, as to any of your suggestions. Um, but law schools, as to law schools themselves, they really probably will update courses, maybe introduce some new courses, and maybe just reevaluate some of the courses and programs that already exist to see whether they already align with the new standard or need to be changed. Um, and the variety of changes in the sort of how much change takes place might depend on the individual law schools and their culture. So that's probably what will happen in the next few years uh, in law schools based on this new standard. But I want to talk about what this means sort of for us as lawyers and what we can do as lawyers if we're anticipating that all these free law folks are going to come back and be educated in cross-cultural competency um, and that we as lawyers were already in practice might start having to anticipate that and also work with diverse clients and a diverse group of attorneys or other folks that we're working with. Um, as always, a lot of my sort of practical suggestions come out of methods that I use when teaching. So I'll talk a little bit about this first and then talk about some other uh, strategies as well. Um, some of my Georgetown colleagues might not be able to see who they are exactly, um, but I'm happy to share the slides later. But some of my Georgetown colleagues and I have begun work on crafting what we call a toolkit um, for interrupting bias and for generally becoming more cross-culturally competent as teachers. We use this as part of the education and training of our teaching fellows. We have fellows uh, for law students to help us provide feedback on first year students' work. And some of the strategies that we've come up with, this isn't a comprehensive list, but some of the strategies we've come up with include paying attention to students' identity markers, so names, pronouns, etc. Avoiding <coughs> making assumptions about what students' prior experiences are or mean. So the whole question of well, where did you go to undergrad and then all of the assumptions that come out of that or what did you do before law school and all of the assumptions that come out of that. We also avoid making assumptions about or try to avoid making assumptions about process. So a very concrete example of that might be something like, you know, had you spent more time proofreading um, when a student might have spent hours proofreading? We try to ask more questions and more open-ended questions of our students to get a better sense of process, experience, and substantive understanding, etc. And try to do the work in advance of articulating expectations for ourselves um, and to our students so that there's a clear sort of communication amongst all the parties involved. But so you might imagine some of these strategies can be directly applied in practice as well with training junior lawyers or working with other um, folks in the legal profession. I also want to close the loop in terms of Susan Bryant's article 
because it really did begin a lot of the conversation in legal scholarship about cross-cultural competency. And so um, in her article, she really identified five main skills that she thought lawyers or law students um, should have, clinical law students at least, should have. The first being the ability to identify similarities and differences between themselves and their clients. So I'll talk about this for a second because we've done this, I've done this with my fellows and it's been a really useful exercise. Just simply going through the exercise of identifying and articulating the similarities and differences between yourself and someone else can unearth a lot of assumptions and help you plan for future interactions. Another skill she identified was the ability to implicate the possible effects of those similarities and differences. So taking that one step further and thinking about what will come out of or what will be a result of these similarities and differences. The third skill was the ability to explore alternative explanations for behavior. So not just reacting thinking through multiple interpretations for behavior. The ability to promote culturally sensitive, um, sensitive interactions by really by planning ahead, so anticipating what the interactions might look like, what things you might need to explain, what questions you might be able to receive, what questions might not be asked by a client because of their background. And then finally, the ability to self-reflect um, when the, again, inevitable blunder is made or the mistake is made um, so that we can learn individually from the mistakes and continue to improve in terms of our work with clients, other lawyers, et cetera. So with that, I just want to end with sort of a some hopes, perhaps, for the future, a couple of questions, and maybe a prompt um, for some of you. Uh, I'll state my position, which overall is that perhaps 303C is imperfect. It is admittedly vague, uh, but as a practical matter, it might be a necessary first step. Um, and at the very least, 303C creates a meaningful way to address diversity in law schools filling that fire gap that was there in the ADA standards. Maybe at a higher level, it might help new lawyers develop skills of reflection, empathy, and critical analysis, and the ability to work with folks of different backgrounds. And then maybe, in fact, so this on a more theoretical level, it might diversify the analytical approaches we take towards the law. There's actually some recent scholarship uh, by, and I'll go ahead and name them so I can acknowledge them, Lucy Jewell, Terry McMurtry Chubb, and Elizabeth Barringer on how the very features of Western rhetoric that we tend to revere in the law themselves reflect elitism and hierarchy. And ultimately, I think the new standard 303C forces us to think about um, two questions. One, what skills do we want lawyers to have going forward? And two, how do we want to future lawyers, and I don't think it's a bad thing at all to be thinking about these questions and to ask institutions to think about these questions. So I don't, I took up a lot of the time, um, but I also want to acknowledge that the CNMI is a diverse place. And so I'll end for questions, but I also want to invite you to share any of your experiences with uh, cross-cultural issues or successes, um, or any of your suggestions for building cross-cultural competency. Thank you. Roberta. So they specify that uh, gender, race, and, and I don't think they did <laughs> <laughs> So they specify gender, race, and ethnicity of when the AB 
Wikipedia talks about cultural competency. I just wonder if um, sexuality and the culture surrounding sexuality and queer and gayness and lesbianism and trans is also part of the discussion in your experience. Yes, um, and I would advocate for that. Um, so, which is why in my beginning, at least, I define culture more broadly. Um, I think part of the ABA drafting was that was sort of an earlier provision that was a not, and they did not amend it or evolve further. Um, but in my experience, at least in teaching at various law schools, that has been a huge part of the discussion. Um, and sort of being able to work with clients of different backgrounds and advocate for clients who have different goals as a result of their backgrounds is a, is a large goal in the clinical setting. It's also a goal that students come in with as well. And tailing off of that, are there human rights organizations or non-legal establishments outside of the ABA that are also informing or advising on the discussion? Uh, you know, that I don't know as to the ABA. Um, but I can say that a lot of the faculty colleagues that I work with do have ties to other organizations. Um, and that does inform a lot of the work that they do, and that ends up um, being something that allows the faculty to sort of work across different fields as well. Thank you.